Okay, everyone, welcome to um, this session. Um, I'd like to introduce Pavel Kozinski talking about various physical aspects of contextuality. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, first of all, um, let me thank you uh, for inviting me here and for, for giving me the opportunity to, to share with you my research. Uh, and actually, it's, it's an honor not entirely my research, so you've seen a whole bunch of people who are my friends and collaborators with whom I've been doing this research. And so, I mean, this, this, this work is very active because you can see a lot of people from various backgrounds. And my background is actually foundations of quantum physics. So for the last six years I've been doing Bell inequalities and uh, contextuality. And actually I've been looking for some connections, so for, for some simili similarities and, and differences between uh, the, the idea of non-locality and the idea of contextuality. Uh, so, so, so I would like to tell you about some, some features. So actually, uh, there are three, three, three features that I would like to discuss. Uh, one of them is uh, the state independence. Uh, another one is, uh, <coughs> is the, the, the problem of exclusivity. And, and the, the, the last one would be the problem of no signaling. So basically the whole idea, I've noticed here that a lot of emphasis is put on, on this order effects. However, I think that most people in the foundations of quantum physics are rather interested in contextuality with, without these other effects. Although, although there is also this huge field of research on on on, on these other effects. But okay, but let me go. So again, what's my motivation? So let me start with the two scenarios. So first of all, we have this this scenario of Bell non-locality. So uh, we have uh, a bipartite system, or in general, a multipartite system. So Alice Bob, Alice performs some local measurements, Bob performs also local measurements, and then in the end they come together, they compare the data, and then they, they see that actually this data cannot or cannot have some classical origin. And classical origin in the sense that uh, they cannot say that uh, the, the, the outcomes of the measurement they did exist prior to the measurement without abandoning the idea of, of some uh, non local interaction between them. Or on the other hand, they need to abandon the idea that, that, that the measurements, that the outcomes of the measurements exist prior to these measurements. So this is this idea of, of local realism. Of course, there is this third possibility that's often like implicitly assumed that there is this uh, free will. Uh, and it was not discussed for a long time, but I know that right now there are also many, many interesting papers on this free will. Okay, then there is this other, other scenario, namely this coach and speaker scenario. So, it's, it's, it's a very similar one, but, but right now we have only a single system. So we have some, some, some measurements performed on a single system. And then in the end, we, we perform an analysis of these measurements, and then we see that if we, if we assume that the outcomes of measurements exist prior to this measurement, then we need to, 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 to basically buy, buy the idea of contextuality, that the, that the measurements, that the outcomes of measurements are, are influenced by whether we measure something with one observable or with the other observable. Okay, so these two scenarios have quite similar mathematics. This was already noticed in, uh, in earlier talks, but have different physics. Okay, so right now the, my motivation is the following. So we know a lot about the first scenario. Actually, actually right now we also know a lot about this scenario here. But I think I can safely say that much more research was done on this scenario than this scenario. Uh, and actually, I, I claim here that contextuality is like 30 years behind this research. And, and just in a moment, I'm going to show you a slide uh, just, just uh, confirming this, 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 this uh, statement. And just pull this one. Okay, uh, so right now, since we know a lot about this thing, the idea is the following. So we know that there are plenty of different interesting effects here. Can we find some analogies of these effects here? Okay, and also vice versa. Okay, then of course there are some properties that will not have analogs. So, so there are some non-local properties that do not have contextual analogs and, and <coughs> contextual properties that do not have non-local analogs. So it would be interesting to also identify them. And in the end. Of course, 
there is a question, what can we learn about the physics behind it? So first, let me introduce the simplified landscape of context duality. So we have this lack of local realities, which is, which is commonly known as non-locality. And non-locality is a special type of context duality. It's a, it's a context duality, context duality done on, on, on a specially separated system. Okay? Yeah, but here, this, this gray area is, is this special type of contextuality, and I'm going to focus on this, on this type of contextuality in my talk. Namely, the contextuality of single objects, but with no other effects. So I call it kind of like hidden contextuality. Because here, we see that, that the probability distributions, like, like, like <coughs> marginal probability distributions, are the same. They, they, they are context independent. Whereas, the, there is the, this, this, this broader bubble here, where we have uh, contextuality with other with, with other effects. So we see that marginal probabilities depend on the context. And that's why I call it explicit context quality. Okay? And again, these three scenarios from the from the mathematical point of view are, are basically the same. But there is completely different physics. So first we have this problem of, of physical assumptions behind the, 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 this hidden variables model. So we need to ask ourselves the question, why are we actually interested in this hidden variable model? Okay. So in case of normality, this is quite simple. And I think that, that's why most of people like this scenario. It's, it's because we are used to, the, to, to thinking that measurements, that the outcomes of measurements exist prior to measurements. This is our classical intuition. And on top of that, we know that there is a strong physical theory, a special relativity, that tells us that, that, there, that there is no superluminal influence. So this is something strong that supports the idea of, 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 of local hidden variables. Okay, yet we see that it's not like that in quantum theory. Then we have this contextuality with no other effects. So here the, the, we have some kind of a problem because Okay, right now we, 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 we say the following thing. Everything is local, so we need to abandon special rel relativity. Uh, but our assumption is the following. It, it, it's again based on, a, on, on our like, everyday experience. So we have measurements of compatible observables. And by compatible observables, I mean observables like quant in quantum theory means that the observables commute. But operationally, it means the following fact. It, so there's no other effect. So if I measure A first and then B, I will get exactly the same outca outcomes if I measure B first and later A. Okay? Uh, so, for measurement of compatible observables, uh, the measurement will only re reveal predetermined outcomes. So, this is the idea of non contextual reality. <coughs> the situation is even worse uh, when we take into account contextuality with other effects. Because right now, we have this explicit disturbance. So, 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 why should we believe in some kind of non-contextual hidden viral system? But we need to remember that uh, this scenario, at least when it was considered by Leggett and Gag, it was considered in macroscopic systems. So, so they said the following thing: that okay, we know that uh, in, in quantum theory, measurements, one measurement may disturb the outcome of the other measurement. But at least it's not something that we that we see in in the macroscopic world. So in macroscopic world, when we should, when we consider some macroscopic system, we can we can assume that measurements are not not disturbing. Okay. So 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 again, we can have the same inequalities, the same mathematics behind, but we have three different different principles, and you can see that actually. These assumptions are kind of like at least from the physical point of view, they are getting like weaker and weaker. Uh, there is also another another impo in, uh, important thing that whereas there is a strong difference between this scenario and this scenario, at least on an operational level, operationally this scenario from this scenario cannot be, I mean, uh, there, 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 is, uh, there is no big difference because compatibility cannot be operationally guaranteed. I can say that two observables uh, commute. But when I measure two observables in a laboratory, it's really hard to, 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 to ascertain that, that, they, that they commute. There will be always some kind of uh, external noise that will int introduce lack of commutation. That's why on the experimental level, we lose 
ability to distinguish between between these two scenarios. And, and uh, I think that that's why your your uh, your idea of this contextuality by default and this inequality is basically take, takes into into account this fact and helps helps to to, to marry marry these two, these two problems. Okay. Uh, so as I promised, let me show some some history in Russia. Well, it might be a bit controversial because I'm showing some ideas and some some names and there are some 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 some, some, some earlier ideas which are not mentioned here. But briefly, let me start with non-locality. So we know that before Bell, this the, the discussions about hidden variables and non-locality was basically French science. So French physics and, and only crazy people were doing this. Uh, but then and so especially after 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 this so so called so called uh, von Neumann's city, city example, where in, in which von Neumann showed that there are no hidden variables, but actually that there was a flaw in, in, in this reason. And this flaw was only showed like 30 years later by Bell. So Bell showed that actually, no, we, we can do really an empirical test of, a, of, a, of, of hidden variables. So it was not a metaphysics, suddenly it was a physics. Okay? Then, there was, the, 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 there was a, like a better experimental idea introduced by Fazer, von Schumann, and Hall, so the famous CHSH and McCorty, five years later. And then, in 1981, there was, there was the experiment. I know that there were some experiments before Aspect, but I think that co commonly it's accepted that it was like the first proper experiment of, of, of the lack of local realism. So, you can see that it was like that. Here, it was like a French science, and suddenly, okay, it's physics, but theoretical physics. Experimental physics and everything verified. <coughs> we know that the world is somehow non local. But then everything uh, was okay, people accepted this fact. But the huge, huge boom, huge thing happened in, in non locality only when people found some, some applications. So people found that the, the, if we have non locality, and with non locality in quantum physics, uh, we have entanglement. So if we have entanglement, we can have cryptography, we can have dense coding, we can have teleportation. And only after that, we have all the, the, this huge uh, theory of entanglement and everything. And, and that's why right now entanglement is such a buzzword. So, 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 right now you can see that people see entanglement everywhere. And, and you can, I mean, if you have entanglement in your paper, then, 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 then there is a chance that you can go to nature. And <laughs> so, uh, I mean, there are some ups and downs of, of, of this, but, but basically this is this is this is. That's the fact. Okay, but right now let's let's uh, uh, talk about contextuality. Uh, contextuality of single objects. So the idea originated about the same time. So it was the idea of Cauchy and Specker. Although actually Bell, Bell had this idea a little bit before, but he was not very happy with, with, with the fact that there was no strong physical assumption. Uh, so that's why right now this idea is, is, is attributed to Cauchy and Specker, or sometimes it's called Bell Cauchy and Specker theory. Okay, so anyway. 60s. Then we need to wait like 40 years for some idea of an uh, experiment. So there was this uh, idea of Kashkov and Sergei Um uh, Again, there were some earlier ideas, but they were they were for composite systems. So, so I think this was the first experimental proposal for for, for a single object, for a single spin, a spin one particle. And then we had to wait till 2011 to have the first experiment was done in a green group of Siding there. So you can see that right now we are here. So we are in this post aspect era. It's <coughs> accepted that the world is contextual, but contextuality is, is, is not a buzzword in the sense that people are still looking for applications. So I, and I know that there were some, some papers uh, showing that you can find some, 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 some applications of contextuality, but in my opinion, I think I can safely say that it's not of the same of the same like, caliber as, 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 as this kind of application. So we are still waiting for, for the big thing to happen. Maybe soon or, or maybe never. So, so I think this is one of the big questions of contextuality. Okay, uh, so right now let me focus on this contextuality of uh, uh, without other effects. So I'd like to show you some, 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 some uh, similarities and differences between non-locality and contextuality. So first, let me start with some fundamental limitations on contextuality. So right now, for a very long time, 
people studying quantum theory were, were asking what's the difference between quantum and classical. So they were studying the boundary between quantum and classical. Right now, people who study quantum theory are studying like this idea of PR boxes and so on. Because the idea is, is that okay, we know that quantum is not classical. But why the world can be like more non-classical than, than, than we observe? So, so people are studying like this boundary from, from the other side. Uh, so, so this boundary is partially defined by by non-signality. We know that we cannot have like super strong non-locality and super strong contextuality because of, of special theory of relativity. Uh, I mean, this is at least within non-locality. In case of contextuality, again, we have this the, this thing that we have this this the, the, this marginals. We have we have the scenarios with non-signality, without all the effects, but we have also things with with order effects, and actually if we allow for contextuality with order effects, then we see that all the violations of different inequalities are stronger. Uh, so, 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 so indeed you see that this non-signaling imposes some, some, some constraints on the, on the strength of correlations. But there are additional limitations because actually uh, we can, uh, for, if we take the CHSH inequality, uh, we know that it can be violated up to 2 root 2, the classical boundary is 2, but then we can have some uh, non-classical non, uh, non correlations that are stronger than quantum mechanical correlations that are still non-signaling, the so-called PR boxes that allows us to, to violate it up to 4. So we ask, are there any additional rules, like, like fundamental principles other than non-signaling, that allows us to somehow single out quantum theory? And up to now, people managed to find some ideas like local orthogonality or exclusivity principle or information causality. I, I don't want to go into details, but I'm just, I'm just highlighting here the fact that apart from this, we can we can have some 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 additional principles. And right now, the the the, the, the area of we we have this interesting area of research in which people look for for, for some fundamental physically motivated uh, principles that will allow us to, to somehow derive quantum theory. I remember that yesterday there was this one interesting question. What if, like 300 years ago, uh, we had some, 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 some quantum, uh, quantum theory? Yeah, so, 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 so we know that, that special relativity and quantum theory, that we had this very, I mean, both theories originated about the same time, but the, origin, uh, the origins were completely different. Special relativity originated from, 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 from beautiful principles. Whereas quantum theory uh, originated because there were some uh, experimental facts that we tried to observe. And then people tried, made some postulates and everything works. But right now people ask, can we derive quantum theory from, from, from some fundamental postulates? Okay. And if yes, then, then some, some, something like that could happen many, many years ago. Just before we observe black body radiation, etc. Okay. Uh, th the next thing, so the resourcefulness of the theory. So we know, I already showed you that for non locality in the answer is yes. And it's because we have entanglement. Here, this is a uh, big question. Because uh, we still don't know whether there are some really meaningful applications of, of context quality. And even if there are, the question is what, what is the quantum thing responsible for context quality? I think that we still don't know what was that, and, and so, so, so we are looking for the answer. Another thing, okay, we know that some effects, like non-locality, can be simulated with classical theory. So basically, we ask, what do we need to realize our, our non-local hidden variable theories? So in this case, it's communication. Okay, in case of contextuality, there are still some questions, but I know that there were some interesting papers by, by, by Adam Cabello, Otfried Wiener, Jan Larson, and some others. And they suggested that it's memory. But still, some more research is needed here. And then, state independence. That's also a very interesting pro problem. Because uh, in case of non locality, we know that non locality can be manifested only by a special type of state. There are entangled states. But a non locality cannot be manifested by. by, 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 by by, by states that are not in time. Whereas in case of contextuality, we have this problem that there is state dependent and state independent contextuality. So in general, if we have enough observables, every state can manifest contextuality. So then there is the question where is the resource? 
as a resource in the state. I mean, state independent contextuality evidently shows you that resource is not in the state. But there is state dependent contextuality, which means that maybe it's some, sometimes here. Oh no. Okay. Uh, let me go to details. So, what is contextuality? So, so I will just repeat something that was already said. To me, contextuality or is is the idea that we don't have different probability distributions. So, if we have hidden variables, they are equivalent to the idea of gene probability distribution. And as far as I know, this, this idea originated in this paper by uh, Arthur Fine. Actually, yeah. one year before them by Supersense and after that was. In a philosophy journal. Okay, good. Thanks. Okay, so let's mm. let's consider a simple system. So here I will, I will use some graph theoretical description. It was already used, and I think it's, it's very nice. So we have three observables. We have A, B, and C. And by by drawing an edge between A and B, I say that A and B are compatible. So I can measure them together. The same for A and C, but because there is no edge between B and C means that uh, I cannot bring them together, okay? so there is no communication between And for many people this would be already some kind of a manifestation of, uh, uh, of, of quantumness of non-locality. But what you already actually showed in, the, in, the, in your presentation, and what I'm going to show you again, is that this system is in fact classical in the sense that there exists a gene probability distribution. So, physically, what, what can we measure here? We can measure a joint probability distribution of A and B. We can measure joint probability distribution of A and C. We can measure only for A, only for B, and only for C. But we cannot measure this. So now we ask, can we find such a thing? Maybe in some artificial way, but still, can we find such a thing such that it will reproduce these marginals? If yes, then, 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 then the system is, is classical. But in order to do this, we need to again assume that this is contextuality without other effects. So in other words, in other words, we need to assume no signal for ball or disturbance or whatever we call so. We need to assume that if we take this joint probability of A and B and sum over B, and if we take the joint probability of A and C and sum over C, we will get the same probability of A. If we do this, we can construct something like that. Then, in this paper, we actually consider more, more scenarios like that. And, and, and we showed something, something which we already discussed, that basically, and, 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 and that's an important thing, provided no signaling, the only way to observe, no con to observe contextuality is in cyclic scenarios. So you need graph with, graphs with cycles. But there are, there are special graphs with cycles. So, so, uh, so let me start with contextual. Uh, Correlations. The first example, and, and the simplest one from the point of view of the number of observables, is, is the triangle. The problem is that in quantum theory, at least in, in case where, where we have this uh, no order effect, it's it's not possible to, to realize because if A commits with B and B commits with C and C commits with A, and all of these guys commit together, so you, it means that you can measure all of them. So you can measure empirically your joint probability distribution. But you can realize this in a, in like a dark scenario. So you can realize it in, in two level systems. If you want to really assume this, this no signaling, then you need to go to higher level system. So then the, the simplest case is, is basically a four cycle. So it's a CHSH number. Okay? Then, but this can be only realized in, in Hilbert space of, of, of dimension four and higher, not in Hilbert spaces of dimension three. Then you can go to this KCPS inequality, so it seems to be a last and a, and a, a, for, for a three level system. Okay. And what I mean by non contextual correlations? So, again, with respect to, 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 to the contextual, to, 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 to the theory with no other effect. So, in this case, if I have a four cycle, but with a di diagonal on the side, I'm able to write down a joint probability distribution, such a thing. And that's why the system is contextual. So if I have a four cycle and somehow I can measure this, then I know that definitely the system will, will, will be non-contextual. 
similar thing with 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 with, with, with this scenario. If I have some diagonals, so basically if I if I can split my 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 n cycles into triangles into three cycles, then I know that definitely the system is is possible. And uh, so I I just show you some some simple method to find the joint probability distributions. Again, the, the same method. So this can be measured because it's a triangle, and right now we assume no other effects, so everything commutes. So the triangle can be measured. This can be measured, and this can be measured. So right now I construct it in such a way. We assume no signaling. And for example, uh, and, uh, by assuming no signaling, I mean that AC can be calculated from this and can be calculated from this and it's the same as with PAC. Okay. Similar thing can be, can be done for this. Okay, so the first thing. I can find some interesting applications. So, uh, I can show that contextual correlations with no signaling obey monogamy. So what I mean by monogamy? That, that, that there were some interesting results that, uh, that there's monogamy of, uh, of, of, of non-locality. Like for example, if we have Alice, Bob and Charlie, if if, they, if each of them have a, have a, like a two-level system, and Alice performs some measurements, Bob performs some local measurements, and Charlie performs some local measurements, then if they find, so what I'm going to say right now is oversimplification, but, but, but the idea is like that. If I have non-locality between Alice and Bob, then I cannot have non-locality between Alice and Charlie. Okay, if I have non-locality between Alice and Charlie, then I cannot have non-locality between Alice and Bob. Quantum mechanically, it tells you the following thing: that if I have a singlet state, an entangled singlet state between two, between uh, spin of Alice and spin of spin of Bob, I cannot have a singlet state between spin of Bob and spin of Charlie. If I would impose that there is a singlet state here and singlet state here, then the total uh, density matrix of Alice, Bob, and Charlie would need to be negative. And so I, I would need to have some, some negative probabilities. Okay. Uh, so that's why actually, in, in such systems, uh, if Alice wants to be entangled with Bob and Bob wants to be entangled with Charlie, the whole system goes into three, uh, three particle entanglement, which is completely different than bipartite entanglement. Okay, but let me, let, let me show you the following scenario. So scenario that I uh, said together with Alan Kabe and, and Daniel Kashikowski. So imagine that we have a bipartite system. One system is like a three-level system, another one is a two-level system. So it's between one particle and a spin half particle. In such a, so, so let's say that Alice has a three-level system. So Alice can perform some measurements, some local measurements, and because it's a three-level system, Alice can check whether her system is contextual or not. Then Bob has a two-level system, and actually taking into account Bob measurements and Alice measurements, they can come together and they can actually check whether there is some non-locality between their systems. So it goes in the following way. So either Alice can consider this, this uh, pentagon scenario on her system, or they can jointly consider this uh, four cycle scenario, which is a CHSH inequality. Okay. Uh, now, what I'm going to show you is the following thing that the whole Actually, all of these correlations that are appearing here can be measured in, uh, in an arbitrary order. It doesn't matter whether I measure first these guys and later these guys. Okay. So, what I can do, I can actually first measure these four correlations, and later I can measure these five correlations. But right now, what you can see is that if I take all of these correlations together, instead of considering like a, uh, this, this, this CH, the CHSH scenario between ICE and Ball and a local KCPS scenario, I can consider this, this kind of like non-local uh, CHSH scenario and non-local KCPS scenario. But in this scenario right now there are diagonals. And I already showed you a few slides ago that if you have diagonals, the system is definitely local. So it means that 
total, total system exhibits no non classicality. Okay? Which means that uh, if I have some, some non classicality for, for Alice system, so for these five observables, then definitely there is no, no non classicality between Alice and Bob, and vice versa. If there is some non, non classicality between Alice and Bob, there will be no non classicality in Alice's system. Okay, so this is this one gummy, and it tells you something important that we know that in this normal scenario there is there is some some kind of uh, uh, strong resource in the entanglement. Okay, then we know that there is uh, that there is a problem with, with with saying something about about resources responsible for contextuality, but definitely we can see that there is some complementarity here because the system is either non-local or contextual. So this, this resource can sit either here or here. Here we can detect it in terms of entanglement. Here we are still unable to detect it, but, but, but we definitely see that something is going on. Okay, uh, the next thing uh, is the state uh, independent. In standard non-locality scenarios, the situation is as follows. So you have entangled system, then you have local measurements, and then you perform these local measurements and you perform some task. task. Whether you violate Bell inequality or, for example, uh, do this uh, cryptography, you perform these measurements and in the end you, you have some local system. The entanglement is consumed. So indeed you see that this is some kind of resource. You have something here, we perform a task, there is no resource here. It was consumed. Whereas in the case of contextuality, we have this problem that we have some kind of state. We perform measurements on the state, and we end up with some other state. But, but this other state does not differ from the state that much. And then, moreover, in case of uh, this uh, state independent contextuality, we can, we can take this state and plug it once again and observe non contextuality. Plug it once again and observe contextuality. Plug it once again and observe contextuality. And then we observe that actually that it's, it's somehow strange because in all experiments, people were, in, in, in which people were testing the state independent contextuality, people were using different copies in each round, in each experimental round, or they were basically re resetting the state of the system. But we said, okay, this is not necessary. So what we did, we consider uh, this uh, simple uh, state-independent uh, scenario of, of Paris and Mermin, so Paris Mermin Square. So I, I, I know, sh should I recall the scenario or not? Uh, is it familiar to most of you? So it's good to recall that. So yeah, so, so I, I think you look. So it's a, it's a scenario that can be realized on a four-level system, uh, and. Uh, for example, it can be a pair of skin half particles, but, but these particles are right now together. Okay, so, so there is no non-locality non involved here. Both particles are together, and then can we, we can measure, measure the standard part of the so, so we measure nine observables. And these observables are chosen such that we have six contexts. And uh, context consists of three observables that are jointly measurable. Uh, so each row consists of three jointly measurable observables. And each column consists of three jointly measurable observables. Okay, and now the, the, the paradox is the following. So, uh, if these these observables are represented by, 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 by some values that are assigned here, and then so all these measurements that are considered here are plus minus one measurements. So, in this case, it wouldn't matter whether we multiply them column by column or if we multiply them row by row. So if we multiply them column by column, in quantum theory, what we are going to, to observe is that this times this times this gives us identity operator. So it means that if we multiply these three, uh, the outcomes of these three measurements, we will always get plus one. The same here and the same here. So if we multiply all nine of them, column by column, we should have plus one. In case we multiply them row by row, what we observe is that here is plus, plus one, here is plus one, that here, it's minus one. So if we multiply all nine of them, row by row, we would have minus one. And this can be recast in the form of inequality, I think, was proposed by Adam Cabello. 
in such a way that if we insist on non-contextual assignment, this value will be always less equal than 4. But because of this, this kind of paradox here, we can go up to 6. And actually, we, can, we will always go up to 6 uh, for any state. Because, because quantum mechanically, all products here equals to identity, and only here we will get minus identity. That's why it's state independent. So what we propose is that we can go, instead of this scenario, like uh, first we choose a context, and then we take our state and we perform a measurement. Then we choose another context, and we take another copy, and we perform a measurement, and so on and on and on. Instead, we said that, okay, we choose a context, we perform a measurement on our state, but then we recycle our state, and after it's spit it out here, we just plug it into the next measuring device, and again, and again, and again. It's only a single state. The interesting thing is that, right now, this whole measurement process, this, this repeated measurement process, is a kind of a Markov process. We have only 24 states, because we have six contexts, it's a four-level system, so each measurement corresponds to four different outcomes. So there are four different eigenstates. Okay, six contexts, so we, in total there are 24 eigenstates. And if, if we perform measurement after measurement after measurement, actually we, we will always end up in one of these 24 eigenstates. So in total it's a kind of like a Markov process, like a random, random walk uh, in a space of 24 different events. And this is the, the transition matrix. It's actually a doubly stochastic matrix. So you can see that after some, some steps, and actually you can see that it's like 10 steps, more or less 10 steps, you arrive, you arrive at stationary distribution. So this whole process can be considered as a the contextuality scenario on stationary distribution. And, this, and the stationary distribution is a maximum living state. Okay? So uh, I think I don't have enough time to, to, to go through the, through the last thing. But Ah, let, let me end here. Thank you very much. Some questions for the public? Yeah. Just, just wanted to uh, clarify a couple of things. Uh, my understanding is that uh, many of your colleagues in physics also would uh, consider non locality a special case of contextuality. Yes. Like Specken, for example. Uh, very explicitly kind of insist on that. So uh, you're separating these things is probably very useful because it's usually more useful to be analytic than to, to mix up things. When you say contextuality of single object versus non-locality as, uh, as transpires this. Yes. But uh, it is also the striking fact that the mathematics is the same in all these physical different cases. And it cannot be a coincidence, right? I, I mean, the, the, the same mathematics indicate something. Yes, exactly, exactly. I mean, okay, so... Uh, I would say the following thing, that uh, we have like two levels of mathematics here. Because uh, the first thing that I would like to say is something that actually... It's not that obvious, but it's very important. Bell inequalities and contextual ethics has nothing to do with quantum theory. Okay, it's it's just some some kind of assumptions, set of assumptions, and then using these assumptions, I derive some some, some kind of test, and then I later only show that using quantum theory, this test will not be passed. Okay, but 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 the whole mathematics to derive this test is the same, whether I speak of this scenario or this scenario or this scenario here. Precise. Yes, but right now. I go into quantum theory, and I'm trying to, to, to show the violations here, here, and here. So the mathematics is similar, but, but there are some differences, and these differences actually lead to these effects here. Namely, here, when I speak of a, um, a sort of spatially separated system, like multi system, I have explicit tensor structure of my Hilbert space. Here, I don't have a tensor structure. When I speak of single objects, I have like a direct sum, direct sum structure. Uh, here, the, the tensor structure is unimportant, but moreover, right now I'm speaking of observables that are not commuting. So, yet another, another uh, set of, 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 of mathematical objects is introduced into my problem. Yeah, so, it, yeah. Yeah. so again, on mathematical level of, of this meta theory of, of, of Bell inequalities, 
mathematics is the same. But when I try go into quantum theory and try to re re realize different scenarios in the mathematics, there are some some differences in this mathematics. And by studying these differences, we just came up with, with all this 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 nice difficulties here. If I may just one follow up very very quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you would not consider the possibility that between the the uh, you know tensor uh, product scenario and single and single object contextuality, there may be some there can be some continuum, some intermediate forms. So from physical point of view, they are completely separate kind of and and there is nothing in between, right? I cannot kind of smoothly go from KCBS to to I mean, something like EPR bomb. I mean, here it's like in a in a tensor in, in a tensor product structure. Well, wherever I have some observable here, it will always commute with an observable here in a different in a different space, which is tensor. Okay. Whereas if I don't have this tensor structure, in order to come up with some observables that are commuting, it's it's uh, it's not that simple. Okay. So, so it's not. Not that I have to take like ident identity tests or something and then something to your identity. Okay. But I don't I don't see how to how to go smoothly from one to another. Well, okay. Yeah. I will not use your view. We have one more question here. Yes, uh, no, regarding that question I want to make a, an observation. Uh, if you take algebraic quantum field theory in that setting it is more clear that it is just uh, algebra and uh, non-commutativity within the algebra. Okay. So you, sh you just have a global algebra and sub-algebra, which are intended to represent local observables. Then you have a more continuous transition between the single particle uh, you know, contextuality and the... You see that? And, and in the end you can show that these are, uh, for example, if, if you have two algebras of different ratios, that is kind of isomorphic to a tensor product. Right? These two algebras are embedded. So you, I think that you, the, the mathematical analysis is much stronger than, than, than what you are saying. That's what I think. And one observation was that you mentioned that contextuality has not yet provided like a resources for information processing or something. Like entanglement. Yeah, I mean, I know that, that your... I, I know that there was some paper, like for example, there was, there was this, this big paper by uh, Emerson. No, no, no. Uh, but my, my point is that you you can consider, for example, quantum information as the information theory arising because the carriers of information are quantum systems. Okay. That, that's that could be an operational definition of quantum information theory. But then, for for example, Schumacher's coding theory is a kind of non-commutative version of Shannon's code in theory. Okay. And then you, you have a, like a tricky, tricky application of yeah, yeah, but, but, contextuality. But, but, it, it's, a, it's an expression of contextuality. Yes, but again, I, I don't know if I understand correctly, but in, a, in this example that you, that you said, everything is actually, the, the whole focus is on the state of the system. Like, like uh, should, should make a coding theorem, it's about the state of the system. Whereas we see that in case of contextuality, State is not that important. No, no, but the, the states of, of the system have these properties because the logical algebraic structure already has these properties. That, that, that's a way, I, a way in which you could see this kind of thing. Okay, I mean, uh, I didn't mean, think about it. Okay, but we can discuss I mean, about this. Well, but, but to me, to just make a final remark from my side is that I always try to look at these problems in a more kind of like oper operational way. Okay, so I think I, I'm thinking. Okay, how to realize it? What's the, uh, uh, the inputs, outputs, and, and and some transitions in between? So, so in case of contextuality, I I still have problems with, with, with really identifying all these all these elements. Hmm. Okay. If there's no more questions, can we thank Pavel again? <laughs> and uh, now we have Etibar.
So more explorations of contextuality. <laughs> right. Uh, so um, my sincere apologies that uh, I once again, you know, have to speak and once again about the same topic. But I already explained that I'm giving a talk in place of my student, Victor Cervantes. And uh, this talk uh, has uh, uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, some introduction. And that introduction heavily overlaps with both my talk in the morning and also the presentation given by Rujang. So I'm going to, to go very fast over this uh, initial things in order not to to bore you. Just to remind you that we're using this double notation where the superscript refers to the context and subscript to the measured property that we also call contents, kind of in general. Uh, so what we measure is the content, you know, under what conditions we're measuring the context. And the context can but does not necessarily represent uh, the the set of the properties being measured together. It can be anything else. And, and the principle that I presented to in my talk, uh, it was presented as a single principle because I was using uh, if and only if structure. And here it is presented in form of two principles, saying that uh, if two measurements or a set of measurements are within a given context, then they are jointly distributed. Otherwise, they are stochastically unrelated. So it's just. Uh, a variant of presenting it, and uh, this means that they have no joint distribution, and uh, so on. And, uh, and I also introduced the notion of a cyclic system, so I will not repeat that. This is an example of the cyclic system of rank 4. And by the way, it gives me the opportunity to make one, one uh, uh, clarification. Cyclic system, the way I'm using this term, is a very special type of system. Not every system that can be presented in the form of a cycle where you, you have, you know, all kinds of, uh, uh, let's say, this uh, uh, the system in which, you know, you can, you can create a graph that has a cyclic structure. Not any such structure will be a cyclic system in this sense. So it's, it's a very restricted thing. And once again, we should have two, uh, two properties measured in each context and each property being measured in two different contexts. And uh, in addition, all the, all the outputs should be binary, plus one, minus one, or zero, one, something like that. And uh, actually, I forgot to put this in here. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we are talking about couplings once again. Now, in my talk, I was using letter S to represent the coupling for R. And uh, Victor uses uh, R tilde, but it is exactly the same type of thing. So we have this system, a cyclic system, and this is a coupling for the cyclic system, meaning that these eight random variables now are all jointly distributed in such a way that this joint distribution is the same as this, this is the same as this, this is the same as this, and the same as the true by the fourth one. And uh, these things here, column by column, they are not jointly distributed, they are stochastically unrelated, these are, uh, uh, excuse me, if, if presented without tildes, then they are not jointly distributed. But with tildes, they impose the joint distribution on the connections. And, uh, and we are seeking not every possible coupling, but the coupling in which the probability with which this equals this is maximum possible. And the same is true about each of these pairs within each of the columns, right? So, um, and we have this definition of non-contextuality, meaning that uh, if such a coupling exists, then the system is non-contextual. If it doesn't exist, it is contextual. The coupling itself, satisfying this property, is called multi-maximal coupling. And, uh, uh, and here is just the definition of this, so I will skip it. And this is the general formula I've shown it to you in my talk uh, in the morning. Uh, it is just a variant of the formulation. Again, the general necessary and sufficient condition for the system to be contextual. Necessary and sufficient, I repeat, because it's very important. Necessary conditions have been known uh, for a long time. And only for some of the systems, we, we knew both necessary and sufficient condition. 
for example, for KCBS, uh, the condition was formulated only as a necessary condition. And in this form, it was tested in this uh, 2011 paper that, uh, that was mentioned in the previous talk. Um, so now I finally get to the empirical uh, work done by Victor Saris, uh, by, by Victor Cervantes. Victor Saris is my friend in Germany. Uh, this um, uh, this uh, type of experiment I've always wanted to conduct, you know, for many years, and uh, uh, and uh, the problem that uh, I faced in, in structuring this experiment many years ago was that. It was obvious to me that the marginal selectivity will not be violated, in other words, uh, that the system will be inconsistently connected. Now, for the first time, you know, for, for, the, for the last couple of years, we have this general theory that allows to deal with inconsistently connected system. So, we went ahead and conducted this experiment, and the idea is very simple. This is uh, an observer in our lab, and these are two stimuli being presented on the left and on the right. And each stimulus can be in two situations. Uh, here, the situation is that both are off. Let's call it off, even though the physical meaning of off can be anything. And then, you know, this can be on and this off. This can be on on the left and this off. And finally, both can be, can be on. And uh, what is required is that the observer responds to each of them separately, saying whether the, the, the the stimulus is on or off, right? So we have this, for example, in this situation, this is the response to left stimulus being in on uh, state uh, in the context when the right stimulus is also in the on state. And this is the same thing, but for the right stimulus, right? So if you have situation like this, then obviously this random variable change. Now it is, oops, uh, now it is uh, here to the left. The response to the stimulus, left stimulus, which is an off situation, in uh, in the context in which the right stimulus is in the in the on state, and so on and so forth. Right. So we have this this situation, and uh, and we can can conduct the experiment by simply presenting these things many 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 times, like hundreds and hundreds and sometimes thousands of times and uh, recording the responses and then counting how many times they said this or that and finally getting the results. So in this particular experiment there were three, uh, three participants in the experiment and we had uh, 5,040 trials. But trials means just one presentation and one response to each of the two stimuli. Uh, and so this was... Uh, uh, this was the, uh, the, the kind of number for the, the total experiments. Now, the meaning of on and off in this particular experiment was related to the position of the dot within a circle. So this is the left stimulus, this is the right stimulus, and the, the dot can be precisely in the center, which is considered to be no signal, and, uh, or it can be it's shifted a bit, up or down, and this would be the presence of the signal, so the on situation. And this is exactly what uh, the subject was supposed to determine, whether the, the dot was precisely in the center or slightly shifted. Right? And because the shift is very small, one of the same stimulus causes sometimes this answer, sometimes that answer, and there is some probability with which the answer will be, yes, it is uh, shifted. Right? So the subject always was determining whether it is shifted. It doesn't matter. So the subject was not asked that whether it is shifted up or down, just shifted or, or exactly in the center. Now this, uh, this is the experimental design, the, the proportion of the cases when both were, were in the center, when one was up and the second was in the center, and so on and so forth. These are the details. And these are the, uh, the uh, kind of the object being measured, uh, you know, corresponding to the letter Q in the general presentation of the of the random variables so it is what we measure uh, you know a dot is presented in the center of the left circle is one object that being measured or a dot is presented in the center of the right circle is another object being measured and the measurement simply means response yes or no 
eccentric or within the center, yeah, or in the center. And so, um, uh, if you uh, if you take, for example, only the central position and and the position when the when the do, uh, only only those trials where the dot could be in the central position or in the position shifted upwards, then you will get this cyclic system of rank four. And you can investigate it by using our formulas of necessary and sufficient conditions, which in this case, of course, uh, uh, are uh, exactly the same necessary and sufficient conditions as for the Alice Bob experiment with possible signaling. And uh, if, we, if we take uh, central positions uh, of the dot together with the upward shifted positions and downward shifted position, then we will get this cyclic system of rank six. And we still can investigate it using the same general theory. And uh, we can define this uh, you know, signal in a variety of ways. We can pair uh, center with, uh, with combined upward and downward shifts, right? And can create yet another system. Or we can actually combine together central position with the upward shift and oppose it to the downward shift. So, from one and the same experiment, we can create a variety of cyclic systems. In this case, not by discretization, but by different groupings. Because the situation is already obvious. So this is, uh, uh, one, uh, this, this is the results of the contextuality analysis of all uh, possible uh, cyclic subsystems of rank 6 that we could extract from this experiment. These are three different observers in the experiment. And these are the results. Now, these numbers by themselves are not important. What is important whether they are negative or positive? Positive number would indicate contextuality. And, uh, and uh, the number less than or equal to zero indicates non-contextuality. So all these numbers are negative. So there is no contextuality in a single of these systems. Now, the number of uh, cyclic subsystems of rank 4 is staggering. It's a lot of them. So. And again, if you look at all these numbers, they are all negative. And so there was not a single case when contextuality was found. This is the rest of the uh, cyclic systems of rank 4. This is another bunch of them. So there are lots of them. And again, if you look at them, there are no, there are no um, uh, positive, non-negative numbers here. Uh, so all of these rank 4 systems. Now, there is also another kind of uh, interesting way of defining, uh, uh, you know, contents in the system. The same with the properties being measured. We can define the context as center or out of the center, let's say, C and U, D, up or down. And, uh, and then we can consider a, a, a system in which, in which we have uh, uh, the, same, uh, the same two properties being measured, but strict, so to say, in different orders, even though in this case it's not the order in the temporal sense of the word. So it is a cyclic system of rank 2, which formally imitates the structure of the question order effect. It's, it's exactly that type of thing. And so, as you see here, you can, uh, you, it is one order center, meaning that on the left it is center, and uh, on the right it is up or down. And here it is on the left, up or down, and here it is in this, and, and on the right at the center. So, so the order in this in this case is purely spatial, right? But but formally it is exactly the same thing, right? And and it's a cyclic system of of rank two. Again, it should uh, it uh, it may it, it exhibit contextuality, it may not exhibit contextuality. So we look at it, and here are the results. All the numbers are are negative again, there is no contextuality here either. There's some positive numbers, hmm? two positive numbers in P3. Oh. Very small Oh, yes, yes, uh, actually it is true. Let me see what that, oh, okay. uh, So, <laughs> yeah, it is true, I forgot about that. Yes, uh, in fact, I now remember that yeah, the paper says that there were two exceptions in this case, and we investigated them statistically to find out that they are just fools, right? Uh, but yeah, thank you. I, I completely forgot about it. Uh, this work actually was Victor's. I mean, he, he is responsible for all these computations and everything. I'm just reporting his work. 
so here is the conclusion that the experiment uh, illustrates the use of the double factorial paradigm in the search of contextuality in behavioral systems. And uh, this paradigm provides a, a, the closest analog in psychophysical research to the alice bobby pr bomb paradigm, because we have this formal structure. But uh, it, is also, uh, it, it also allows us to go to the highest, higher ranks than, than in the alice bobb experiment. We found no evidence of contextuality. And uh, uh, that is just one additional evidence uh, added to a lot of negative findings that, you know, wherever we looked for published results, our own results, you know, these millions of, of systems investigated by Ruzhan, uh, nowhere we find any evidence of contextuality. Now, uh, I will stop here and uh, actually let me just run, uh, add one, one more uh, kind of remark. Uh, you know, uh, when people realize that in quantum mechanics, uh, uh, we have these contextual situations. Uh, there was this hope that maybe when you look at the pe at uh, you know at human behavior, or biological behavior, uh, or social behavior, you know because we have free will and psyche and all of these you know, mysterious things, then maybe uh, you know people, in spite of the fact of being the, that they are macroscopic objects, they will exhibit the same contextuality as the electrons and photons. Right? So this expectation was so strong that people actually very much wanted to find contextual. So it was, it was the result that, that people wanted to, to find. And, and they reported a lot of cases when they saw that they found it. All of these cases were marked by the fact that this uh, uh, consistent connectedness was violated and they didn't take it in, into account when they applied the formulas. So uh, the, the, the computations were flowed. Uh, from a physicist's point of view, so it is kind of disappointing to, to disappointing to psychologists. And uh, from the physicist's point of view, perhaps it's not uh, anything remarkable when I mentioned it to someone uh, at a physics conference, if to a physicist, uh, then his response was, well, so what? I mean, it's microscopic systems. Why people should exhibit any contextuality? I mean, they are huge, right? Uh, but I, I would like to make uh, just uh, I would like to emphasize that the lack of contextuality is actually a good thing for psychology, not a bad thing, to the extent it falls. Because lack of contextuality is a constraint. You see, quantum mechanics doesn't need any additional constraints. It's already computational theory with very, very good degree of predictability. In psychology, we do not have any theories comparable. To, to quantum mechanics. So the more constraints we can impose on the, on the possible behavior of people, the better it is for us as scientists. So it would be actually worse if we had you know, all kinds of crazy violations of all possible inequalities, right? If we could observe PR boxes you know, in the behavior of people, uh, well, I mean, it would, maybe it would be exciting to report, but at the same time, it would be much more difficult than to predict anything. So this Lack of contextual, to the extent we can generalize it, is a good thing. It is a predictive, it, it adds to the predictive power of psychology. And now I will shut up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So there's plenty of time for questions. Um, Zuno? I have a question, just to the last remark. Do you think this non-contextuality or um, well, your result is done, or is obtained, perhaps because your experiment is, is you understand your experiment. It's well defined, and that is that the, the, you 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 define the experiment, and then you get the results, and that's why you actually you will not get this strange behavior. Because sometimes in physics, you, you see that the, the problems arise because in some ways you will have things which are not so well defined. Alice and Bob, you know, and is not something that you can say this, 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 you cannot isolate uh, things. And, well, so I, I don't know if you have some general idea on that. Well, for exper experiments. I, I'm not sure I understand it clearly. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, 
Why should why you expect that is, uh, strange things when this L thing is well defined? And well, well don't, don't, don't call it strange, but the point is that, you know, if, if an experimentalist in quantum physics also knows, you know, what uh, the, the apparatus is doing, you know, what kind of conditions are created, what is being prepared, which, which beams are going in which way. So, you know, they know also a lot of things. It's a well-defined experiment. But then, then uh, they may not know some details or overlook them. But, but ideally, you know everything about your experiment and only the outcome is unknown to you. Here it is the same thing. I mean, laboratory experiment in psychology is essentially no different from quantum physics. We control the stimulus, control the conditions, you know, repeat the so presentation. You say you do, you do it. Everyone expects it because it would be nice that it would be like that. But in physics, it's because actually the, the, the angle of state is really at the beginning something which is a, st a strange oh. thing, and you have to prepare. You have to to, to prepare this state and, and be uh, careful that it did not. Uh, so you think that if, if physicists expected, yeah. they think they wouldn't have got an entanglement. Well, I think it's it's a problem of defining yeah. the system. Well, then, I mean, but preparing it is, it is a bit yeah. yeah. Uh, Difficult for me now to uh, yes. Um, the participants in the experiment, did they know what the experiment was about? Uh, uh, you know, uh, I now I do not completely, I do not remember, maybe one of the three was Victor Cervantes himself, in which case he knows what the experiment is about. Because I can imagine now, it influence behavior a lot. Well, uh, yeah, it, it is kind of what people usually imagine. But in psychophysics, it is a long tradition that you always have two or three naive subjects. And, and the experimenter also serves as a subject, too. And virtually nowhere there is any difference in the results between knowledge and not knowledge. It is a low-level processing. You know, your, your higher-level kind of knowledge doesn't influence this very simple cognitive function that you have performed. Uh, in in Rujan's experiment, I know for a fact that you served as one of the subjects uh, you know, in, in her experiment. Now, here I'm not completely certain uh, whether Victor was one of them or not. It, it is in the paper that was submitted. I, I, I can imagine that the disappointing result, or not disappointing result of your want of contextuality, might be because the task seems a bit easy to me. That people don't make enough mistakes to see any new behavior. Well, uh, uh, the, uh, the task is easy, it is true, but the people make a lot of mistakes in the sense that, you know, the, the thing is uh, off center and people often say, no, it is in the center and vice versa. Right. Because I, I could imagine if you do something similar with like with true tasks, like Find the word red and green that you can reply. More complex stuff that you would more rapidly see some potentiality in maybe. Maybe, but there is no basis to believe this. I mean, but uh, everything is possible. That, that's exactly the you know the, the the crux of the issue for all of these attempts to uh, to investigate contextuality in psychology is that we are not being guided by a theory because there is no theory. To so as uh, Kuzinski told us, you know, uh, contextuality itself uh, in quantum mechanics has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. It's a purely probabilistic thing, I completely agree. But you have a theory that guides you into what kind of experiment you should conduct, what kind of results you can expect, right? You can compute this axis, you know, in order, in order to maximize the chances of violating those and equals and things like this. In psychology, we are just guessing. Right? We can try more complex things, less complex things, you know, yeah. conceptual combinations, you know, psychophysical experiences. So we are just trying kind of groping in the dark. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, negative results here, uh, you know, do not mean that you know there will never be a positive result. Positive meaning not finding potential. Mm -hmm. But again, I, I emphasize that actually it is bad. I hope that contextuality will not be found, or if found, would be easily explained as some kind of artifact. Yeah. Just a uh, question. Uh, my thing is that your definition is very suitable for physical properties of systems in an operational way. Uh, but 
but maybe uh, psychologists or people working in linguistics, they they are looking to other aspects of, of systems, like for example, you know, language, uh, which is not a physical thing itself. Uh, even if you can reduce it in the end, I don't want to discuss about that. But maybe there, are, it, it, I, I will never expect that by by exploding two peoples and then looking at correlations, you ever look at an operational violation of value inequalities mm -hmm. because of what you say. I mean, they are too big. Uh, it is it's impossible. No physicist will expect that. But maybe there are different definitions of contextuality which can be applied and are meaningful in linguistics and uh, psychology. What, what will you say about that? It, it, is, it is a very good point and very good question. So it allows me to say that, yes, uh, contextual, uh, contextuality is used in psychology and linguistics as a variety of meanings. And most of these meanings uh, have nothing to do with this type of contextuality. And they all have to do with, with the uh, lack of consistency in connectedness. In other words, with violations of uh, what uh, Korzynski called an order effects. It's not the way I'm using that term. But simply meaning that in different contexts, the distributions are actually different. Right? So you are looking at the word. This word has a meaning, but if, if it is preceded by another word, the meaning changes. Uh, this is just a uh, change of the distribution. Right? I do not call it by itself uh, contextuality. It is a contextual effect, right? but it's not contextuality in that interesting sense of the word. So uh, it, is, it is definitely that you know, if, you are, if you are taking every contextual effect, so every influence of something else upon your response to something else, right? If you are considering it contextuality, then it is absolutely 100% ubiquitous. Right? It's everywhere. There is, in, in, only in physics we find the situations when you can avoid, like, because of the space-like separation, can avoid this inconsistency of connectedness. In psychology, if you have hundreds of stimuli and you are responding to this, uh, to this one, 99, the remaining 99 will influence your response to this one. Right? So you have to, to kind of work it in and essentially to, to try to find whether there is anything else in addition to that. Because that by itself is not surprising or especially interesting. Right? So uh, that's, that's my kind of answer to your question. But uh, it, is, it is definitely true that it's different meaning. But again, uh, at the same time, I have to emphasize that uh, uh, lately, because of the quantum cognition, you know, uh, popularity of quantum cognition movement in, in cognitive science, and because people became aware of the, uh, of the contextuality problem in quantum mechanics, many psychologists now are using the term contextuality in that particular sense, or at least kind of think that they are using it in that particular sense. They often make mistakes. Right. Okay, so is that possible that to use method and not sensitive enough? Uh, it is a necessary and sufficient condition. So in what sense? Uh, it, it is a necessary and sufficient condition for contextuality expressed in terms of probabilities. The only, the only sensitivity issue that can arise here is purely statistical. If the number of measurements is very small, then your empirical frequencies may not represent probabilities very deeply, right? And, uh, uh, but this is not the case in most of our uh, cases. I mean, we have tens of thousands of measurements, usually, uh, you know, from which we compute our frequencies. So this, this stati and, and we do normal statistical analysis showing that all of these things are significant, you know, confidence intervals and all of these things, right? Those two cases, by the way, that your sharp eyes kind of uh, noticed in that table, uh, they, they were analyzed statistically and shown that they are not significantly above zero. Right? So it is a statistical fluctuation. No, and, uh, yeah, at the probability level, probably, yes, yeah, I couldn't find it. But maybe before you measure probabilities, I mean, there is something maybe underlying probability. Uh, no, uh, you see, uh, our experimental conditions are discrete, right? So there is no sensitivity issue there. 
uh, you know, and and uh, once again the inequalities are presented in terms of probabilities. They are as sharp as possible because they are criteria, necessary and sufficient conditions, right? Uh, and uh, and uh, I repeat, the only possible issue is purely statistical. If you if the number of measurements is not sufficiently large, but that's very large in our experiments, very large. There are indeed some experiments reported in psychology where you have only you know under hundred measurements or something like that, and there there are possible uh, statistical problems. Okay, so we're current. Oh, um, we're going. Yeah, is it a short it's one it's or? Uh, no. Okay, so we're going into the break now. I think uh, the next session starts at half past three. So let's thank Etigar again. Thank you.